Good morning, and welcome to the Blockade Runner podcast. This is John, and with me this morning is Ryan. Good morning. And uh, it's been a couple of weeks, but we're back to record an episode, of course, um, all about The Last Jedi. But today we're going to focus on the books supporting the release of the movie. So we're going to talk the art of book. We're going to talk the visual dictionary and uh, maybe a little bit of DJ and Canto Bite. Is that right, Ryan? That is exactly right. That's the exact agenda. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, (laughs) So, uh, yeah, uh, we've talked about it before. Like, I think I've probably mentioned it quite a few times, but um, the release of the movie, uh, obviously, you know, we love going to see the movie a bunch of times and the buildup is exciting and all those things, um, the whole process we love. But um, a huge component of um, a new Star Wars movie for me is um, just digging into and really loving um, the art of books, uh, the visual dictionary books that support it, the cross section book, um, and stuff like the Canto Bite uh, book, which I haven't been able to get to yet, but uh, I'm looking forward to. But just all that supporting uh, material um, we love, um, I love, and uh, it's it's a really crucial part of the experience of of a new Star Wars movie that uh, luckily we're we're able to have. Um, as a kind of a ritual or um, something we can count on um, happens every time and, and it's great. So um, uh, I think I'm, I always meant to do this with both force awakens and rogue one do like a, a art of and visual dictionary show. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't think we ever got around to it. So we just, you know, obviously we're informed by those a ton and, and discuss things that we've, we've read in those books um, all the time. But uh, I don't, I don't think we've ever done a show like this one, uh, Ryan, where we really, dial in and, and focus um, specifically on those books for the whole show. So I, uh, I'm excited to, to get into it. Yeah. Um, so we're going to start with the, uh, the art of book. And um, as I've been reading the art of and the visual dictionary, I've just been making notes all the way through. And so I have like a million. Um, and uh, we're, we were talking before we started recording, I'm going to try to be disciplined and uh, not spend too long on any one point. So so we can get through um, through most of them. Um, that being said, the first thing I want to talk about in the art of book, and uh, Ryan, I see, uh, grabbed his and has it in front of him, and uh, I've got mine here too, so we'll be kind of flipping through them. Uh, by the way... Both of beautiful. us took the, the dust dust cover dust oh, yeah. jacket off <laughs> yeah 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 i always do i always have to take the dust jacket off until i'm done yeah. reading the book yeah um, same with me yep. yeah i gotta keep that pristine so um but i do love that painting on the front there um of poe taking on that dreadnought um but yeah the the, the first thing i want to talk about in um in the art of is the the introductory um section which is probably the best uh, we've gotten in one of these books i think um, Ryan Johnson writes an introduction, which is, um, which is great. Um, uh, but then there's an intro from, uh, Phil Zostak, the author of, uh, both this, um, art of book and, uh, I believe the art of the force awakens as well. And there's just a brief, um, essay or introduction here in the beginning that is really, really great. Um, and there's a couple things in here. So this is on page 15 of uh, the Art of Book. Um, but there's discussion in here um, straight from Ryan Johnson about um, Luke's perspective um, and what he's, uh, what he's doing um, on Octo and the fact that he feels like he's making a sacrifice um, and that it's not, the, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, he writes here that uh, I knew that Luke or Brian Johnson says, I knew that Luke needed to have a reason that he actively thought being on the island was the right thing to do and was the best thing for everybody, including Leia, including his friends, including the entire galaxy. In his mind, this was an act of tremendous self-sacrifice because all the universe wants is for him to come back and help. Um, and I just wanted to lead with that and throw it out there, both because it was a great moment to read that in uh, in the book and also because um, there's you know so much rightly so, so much debate about Luke and um, his choice uh, in the sequel trilogy to be out there on Octo. So, um, you know, you hear different interpretations of it, but I think it's cool to hear straight from Ryan Johnson, like in his mind, Luke is making a sacrifice. He's not totally just being a coward. He's doing something that's difficult and uh, he believes the right thing to do. Um, So, uh, but then in terms of... uh, Zostak's essay here uh, in the introduction of uh, the art of uh, man he does and I'm sure you you've uh, looked through this Ryan but he he focuses um, on the choices made by uh, Obi-Wan Luke and Han Solo all to 
um, to not fight um, in their kind of final moments. Um, ben Kenobi in A New Hope, uh, Luke in Return of the Jedi, and uh, Han in The Force Awakens. And it was just one of those moments I'm reading this introduction to this book, which I'm so excited to read. And uh, I see this kind of be brought together um, by the author, um, a discussion of of, of these three um these three characters choosing not to fight and choosing to give up control and uh, potentially sacrifice themselves. And I thought it was uh, just brilliant. So um, you need to pick up the book, The Art Of. And uh, when you do, be sure to read this introduction from uh, Phil Zosak because it's it's really, really good stuff. Um, last thing from that too um, is... Uh, Something I think is really important for The Last Jedi, uh, Zostak, towards the end of this essay, uh, discusses Joseph Campbell's uh, hero's journey. And he writes, um, if Joseph Campbell's hero's journey is a reflection of humankind's journey beyond the innocence of childhood into the wider knowledge of responsibility, then what comes after the hero's journey and happily ever after? What of the middle-aged hero who now faces inevitable mortality and loss? Um, I love that. I, I love that because um, I've been having discussions with some of my friends uh, about the fact that um, the sequel trilogy kind of ruins the story of the original trilogy characters or uh, or something like that, that it's disrespectful and um, that it's a, I, I don't know, a slap in the face to the original trilogy characters because they're not perfect and like um, their victories in the original trilogy were not ultimate. And uh, I think that's absurd. Uh, so I, uh, but I love the the way that uh, Zostak puts that there. The idea that um, you know it, it's interesting to look at this kind of classic mythic storytelling uh, of the hero's journey, and then say, "But what about what's after that?" Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, the intro is great. The intro to the book is great, um, and that's a really text heavy. Uh, or I guess our discussion here so far, my discussion so far has been very text heavy uh, mm -hmm. in what is very much a visual book. So, um, you know, as we go forward, we'll talk more about um, visual stuff. Uh, it's also really cool that uh, like the first part of this book has a lot of um, concept art from The Force Awakens because um, this is stuff that they were um, hesitant to include in The Force Awakens art of book in fear of giving too much away. Yeah, um, I love how they like refer to it as preserving the film going experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, so you know, like, you got yeah. don't don't spoil stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think too, it's just like it takes. I don't know when these books start being printed up and shipped out, but it's before the release date of the movie, um, mm -hmm. and considerably so, I'm sure. When when you're talking about printing them, and uh, yeah, it's not even so much like, am I going to read the book myself before? Uh, I see the movie and and have something spoiled, but just I think if the in the production process, um, that stuff can get can get ruined too. So, mm -hmm. yeah, because uh, a good chunk of the visual dictionary was like scanned or something before the release of um, the <clears throat> Last Jedi. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, I definitely never clicked on any of that myself. No. Um, both because I don't want to see all that before the movie comes out, and also because um, I don't want to spoil the the enjoyment of like actually flipping through the book when I get it, mm -hmm. you know, versus seeing some scans on my phone. Um, so, yeah, I, I think um, I don't think there'll be as much stuff in the Last Jedi that uh, that that was held back, um, you know, that we'll see in the next Art of book necessarily, um, although. The, the Luke stuff in the conclusion, I guess there's not maybe as much as there otherwise would be, but, but there's this, this, mo this movie, I feel like is, is covered pretty completely here. Um, it seems like so. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, so we're still, or I'm still like in the first 20 pages of the book and there, there's one last thing I'll bring up just very quickly, um, which is on page 19. And that is, this is something that uh, some outlets have picked up and talked about. So it's not, you know, probably most people have seen this by now. Um, but uh, it's something I still want to mention just because there's so much, I think, misinformation and misunderstanding about the way these movies are put together. Um, and this is the uh, the portion of the, the book on page 19 that discusses um, story meetings and uh, 
concept art, you know, visualization meetings in January of 2013, when George Lucas was still involved in the process of putting together The Force Awakens, um, and uh, discussing Luke, you know, kind of like rediscovering himself and in, in, uh, in the movie because he's off on some remote planet, you know, kind of like um, distancing himself from every, everything else and everybody else. Um, you know, being a hermit off somewhere on some other planet. And, uh, and, and so I just think like, it's interesting to, uh, point out or, you know, be aware of the fact that like, this is something that goes back to way before the force awakens ever came out. Um, it goes back to the very earliest stages of planning the sequel trilogy. The idea that Luke would be a hermit and he would be kind of, he would have cut himself off from, from the rest of the galaxy. Um, so, you know, just in case you're one of those people who's like, not my Luke Skywalker and Ryan Johnson, you know, ruined my childhood and all that stuff. It's really been part of the plan, even since when George Lucas was there. So, um, maybe you don't love the way it was, it was done in the last Jedi, but it's certainly not like some radical idea that, uh, Ryan Johnson came up with on his own. It's always been part of the plan. And, uh, and I think it's something that works really well. So. Yeah. I have I'm like holding myself back so so hard right now because <laughs> I have so many opinions about this. Yeah, but yeah. We we the show must go on. The show must go I on. I think we could really get stuck in this. So. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But like yeah. Uh, you know, I think in this case it's just like, <laughs> hey, here's the evidence. You know what I mean? Like you can react emotionally to what you see in the Last Jedi any way you want to, but I, I just get a little annoyed when when um a lot of discussion I have with people and it, you know, it, it's nobody's like required. It shouldn't be required that you're like an expert on the pre-production process of a star Wars movie <laughs> to like, go watch it and enjoy it. I get that. But when you speak authoritatively about stuff, you don't understand, uh, which I hope we're not doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that like the crux of this podcast? <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. But you know what I'm saying? Like I just, I just hear people say so much like, Oh, this is what they did in the, in the, production process of the movie and, and wrecked everything. It's like, um, pay attention a little more and don't jump to conclusions <laughs> that support your, yeah, I don't know. Okay. We, we gotta, we gotta move on. All I'm right. like biting my tongue right now. All right, let's jump. Let's jump. Let's jump. <laughs> um, there's beautiful art, uh, all mm -hmm. throughout Octo. My favorite part of the movie probably is the Octo stuff. Um, mm -hmm. at least visually, like it's so yeah. beautiful. Um, and there are gorgeous paintings for a good 20, 30, 40 pages of yeah. uh, all the Octo stuff. A, a lot of, uh, prequel looking, uh, building designs here. Y yeah. Mm -hmm. That were not used. Like specifically the Jedi temple on Octo, mm -hmm. uh, which Doug Chang and other artists were working on designing to make George happy because George was still part of the process. All I'm saying, but anyway, yeah, exactly. Uh, um, yeah. And they, um, I think just a shout out to the, uh, most recent episode of blast points, um, podcast who also did a art of book, uh, that and that episode's already out and they like really, um, go into that side of things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. But they do it in a fun and snappy way. Um, where <laughs> we're like being exhaustive here, uh, early on. So yeah, that's mm. like the, that's our favorite podcast. It's the best podcast blast point. So go check that out. Um, I'm looking right now at uh, the uh, the concept art, the section uh, for the caretakers and for the porgs, um, which is awesome stuff, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I love some of these early Kira designs as well mm. um, in this section. Um, she looks very like comic booky, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm like page 27, and it's uh, it's super awesome. I mean, obviously, I love the way like Ray ended up looking, but um yeah these uh these these Kira designs they're almost like um oh like uh -huh. Korra esque um if you're an, an avatar universe fan um but really really cool yeah that is one uh, definitely interesting thing about the about the uh, the art of books is like you know and and just the the art teams that are putting together um stuff in the in the pre-production uh process it's just like you know, some of this art looks um, stylistically is very different, you know, and uh, that's cool to see the movie um, through these different like styles and uh, approaches to creating concept art. Because um, some of it is, is uh, you know, borderline like photorealistic or uh, mm -hmm. is, is going for that look anyway. 
and some of it is much more like impressionist and some of it's more like comic booky, like you say. So, um, yeah, it's really cool. But, um, the next kind of note that I had, uh, pointed out here is for, is on a uh, page, um, 69. Um, so nice. I have to go past, yeah, nice. I have to go past all of the, uh, sea cow stuff. Um, Actually, in doing so, I'm I'm um, flipping past the uh, pages about the the Jedi Library, the tree. Mm. Um, you know, I I think the tree looks great and it's really cool, but like, I don't think I I don't know if I really like the idea that it's it's uh, based on or or shaped uh, similarly to the um, the Rebel Alliance logo. Um, yeah. Yep. I'm I'm not a huge fan of that either. I think we've. <laughs> I think we've seen a little too much, um, you know, explanation of the Rebel Alliance insignia. Um, it's one of those things that people just keep wanting to explain the roots of. And I don't know what's going on within Lucasfilm, but um, I remember, you know, pre-Disney buyout when the, the Rebel Alliance insignia was um the oh, what it, force unleashed the star killer um his family crest oh yeah <laughs> um or something and like i don't know like it 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 just keeps popping up and i don't know i don't think it needs the rebel insignia needs to be rooted in anything, especially not something going back to the origins of the Jedi order. Right. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, I mean, the best and that's also like, sorry, it, oh, that's fine. totally in contrast with the, um, like the themes of the film and like the idea that the, um, you know, the, the rebel, alliance would be like intrinsically linked to the like jedi order and the um you know because that's kind of like the downfall of the republic and yeah that's that's exactly that why yeah. that's exactly why i'm not into it is because it's like yeah. okay like i would think like the jedi is some uh, the jedi are something very s separate from the rebel alliance and I, I can understand like obviously the jedi existed they created this tree or you know they've have this iconography or whatever and then you know thousands a thousand years later whatever um the the rebels kind of adopt that and bring that into their own uh, look or whatever but it just suggests like too close of a connection between the jedi and the rebellion and the rebellion is like a military organization mm -hmm. the jedi or something completely different so i just don't think that really makes sense and in fact when those two groups i guess i mean not the rebellion but when the, the, the jedi and the clone army you know when that got too yeah. entangled that's like the downfall of the jedi yeah so yeah exactly and, and luke is, speaks out about that like in the film and it's separation of church and state right 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 that's what we need right. separation yeah. of church and skate um mm -hmm. yeah, totally. so uh and plus my favorite like take on where the rebellion, the rebel insignia came from so far is kind of the Sabine thing in Star Wars Rebels, because she's got her like starboard thing that it seems like would morph into the rebel insignia, which yeah. I don't really need that either, but that, I don't need least, it. But it makes more sense, you know. Yeah. Like, she's somebody who's an early part of the rebellion and yeah. Yeah. You know I mean? so, um but uh Anyway, if I could just point out, I think this is like one of my last quotes. I don't have that many quotes. <laughs> we'll talk more about the okay. But there's great quotes in this book, so I do want to include them. Um, there is a, a wonderful quote that I think a lot of people would do well to read um, on page 69, uh, like I said. And he's talking about uh, Ray meeting Luke. And uh, Ryan Johnson uh, says, here's somebody who needs you, who needs your help. If you think you're throwing away the past, you're fooling yourself. The only way to go forward is to embrace the past, figure out what is good and what is not good about it, but it's never going to be part of who we all are. And that includes Ray, who grew up hearing the legends about the Jedi. So the notion of, nope, toss this all away and find something new is not really a valid choice, I think. And I still see uh, interpretations of The Last Jedi all the time that seem to be like, oh, Ryan Johnson hates everything that came before and he wants to completely destroy Star Wars. And that's why, you know, it's The Last Jedi and uh, it's destroying the Sith and the Jedi and he's trying to like throw everything away and burn it all down. And I mean, all you have to do is watch the movie and see Luke Skywalker say at the end, like, I won't be The Last Jedi and Rey's going to carry on the Jedi, like to know that that's not really the final conclusion. 
Um, and it's just an idea that's being explored in the movie. But this is straight from Ryan Johnson, who's saying like, hey, that's not really valid. You can't just uh, destroy everything and act like it never existed because that wouldn't work. Um, so yep. just uh, a great quote from Ryan Johnson. All mm-hmm. right. Um, if we and keep, I, I think uh, it is worth noting that I think um, I, I texted you about this when I was first reading the art of book. Um, I feel like um, I haven't gone back to compare to the Force Awakens and Rogue One art of books, but I feel like like there's so much Ryan Johnson in here, like mm. like actual like interviews and like quotes and stuff. Um, that I know we definitely didn't get with JJ. Um, but I think there was more with uh, Gareth Edwards, but like I feel like like every other page is like Ryan Johnson talking about something in here. Yeah, it seems like he must have uh, been very generous in sitting down and um, and wanting to discuss this stuff and uh, you know, giving um, uh, Phil Zostak and uh, Abrams books and everybody like, um, a lot of time and, and, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, giving them a lot to, to work with, which is awesome. Um, so for sure that, uh, that's really cool. And just like, yeah, I love the enthusiasm, you know? Um, so absolutely. Um, looking at page 82 here and seeing, um, young Kylo Ren in his pajamas, uh, which I think (laughs) is, uh, is really cool. So, um, yeah. Um, and there's some some like young Jedi student things there too, which are are really cool. Um, so there's been some uh, theorizing and, and discussion from uh, Star Wars fans that perhaps uh, a Luke a Luke and young Kylo uh, animated TV series um, is uh, on the way. And I think that might just be like uh, hopeful speculation. I don't know if there's uh-huh. there's um, there's much uh, you know basis in in reality for that, but that could be fun. Or the opposite of fun, <laughs> like, but yeah, I mean, yeah, hmm. that, yeah, I don't know, yeah, right. I don't know. Right. Well, here's something um, I know about, thanks to the art of book on page ninety two, and uh, those are Snoke's um, gold slippers, Snoke's mm. gold slippers, which are featured um, pretty prominently in the um, in the uh, the um, visual dictionary, also but Mm -hmm. um but they're great um i love uh i love snoke's um you know gold his all of his gold clothing um is awesome it's very ostentatious and it's just a different look for um a star wars villain so um yeah i Um, i love how um on this page there's like little um descriptions of every you know object every picture and stuff and then there's the picture of his ring and it just says snoke ring snoke ring (laughs) (laughs) yeah 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 yeah. um because wasn't that something that people were like going real deep on like prior to the release of the movie like we go like zooming in on a scan of Snoke's ring and like, what does Snoke's ring mean? <laughs> yeah. It must be like a, a chunk of Mustafar or like, <laughs> you know, some, yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. I mean, you know, they could still write a story where it ends up being something like that, but, mm-hmm. but yeah, absolutely. Um, so, and that was a Michael Kaplan thing, according to the art of book is to have Snoke in all gold. And I think that was a really, Mm -hmm. Uh, really good call so um then on page 96 uh sticking with snoke here for a second um i i love this uh there's there's a quote here on page 96 um about the fact that uh the look for um snoke's throne room uh if they're gonna call it that um is uh is really based on um this old um ralph mccrory drying of darth vader in hell um, mm-hmm. and so they kind of like really looked, um, at that and, and drew a lot of inspiration from that. Um, and I think that's cool cause it's, you know, obviously very star Wars. And then, um, also a discussion of like the whole wizard of Oz factor with the, uh, the curtain. And I think that's really cool too. Cause I know when we were seeing, um, the first images of Snoke's throne room, I was like, well, why are there just like giant red walls? Like, it seems like very, um, not bland's not the right word, but just so, uh, simple almost that it was like not designed you know what i mean like under art designed or whatever yeah um and <laughs> it turns out this 
yeah, and it turns out to be actually like super, super cool. So, um, yeah, another uh, another great uh, moment here in the art book is is to to hear that connection to the uh, Ralph McQuarrie Vader in Hell um, painting. Mm. So, um, yeah, but we've got uh, lots of great concept art of the Praetorian Guards, and uh, now we're getting into the Canto Bite section, um, as well as some uh, discussion of ships and things like that um one of the things that's uh another because okay the art in these books is beautiful um and it's you know that's the that's the main attraction here but uh in addition to that you know we're not getting making of books concurrently or like alongside the release of the movie um which is a bummer but then also maybe makes a lot of sense if you think about it um like a making of book 20 years later is probably a better book than a making of book that comes out, you know, a month after the movie. Um, so although this, I'd read both, I'd happily oh, read yeah, both. For sure. <laughs> but especially considering um, how intertwined the writing and conceptualization of these three movies is like the fact that they had to withhold stuff from the, Force Awakens art book and put it in this one because, you know, it was, uh, um, you know, because it would have been like a huge spoiler, but also because like this, the writing process has been concurrent, um, you know, since yeah. the like 20, 2012, 2013. Right. Right. But so, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. The, the, the movies are very much being developed together, but not only that, um, you know, we're not getting a making of book, but when you read the art of book, it is in, you know, it does, tr uh, kind of trace the production process of the movie. Um, and so it, it's like a, you know, primarily an art of book, but then there's, there's also like a, a making of, um, kind of story narrative going on throughout it where you are getting the, the filmmaking process to a certain degree. Um, and, uh, you know, an example of that is like on page 107, um, you know, we're seeing this art that is uh, demonstrating uh, or kind of showing us the original opening of the movie, which was going to be to, you know, um, move from the crawl down to like a, a pod that uh, Finn was in. So like you'd see like the window of the pod he's in and then um, kind of like come down, um, it, the camera would move down and then over his face in this pod that he's in. And I'm assuming it would be like in a ship somehow or like, you know, uh, I don't think it was just going to be floating in space necessarily, but um, that was going to be the way the the film opened, is to go from the crawl to to Finn in his um, in his like med pod. So, you know, uh, it's just cool to see kind of like how the thought process and the development process went in terms of coming up with the story. And um, you know, if you're looking for that making of um, kind of narrative or whatever, um, I'm sure we'll get a book like that you know, down the road at some point about these movies, but um, the art of books right now do a really good job of uh, kind of um, telling that story alongside um, the, the uh, production art, pre-production art and all that stuff. So it's cool. Yeah. Um, all right. Oh, page 203. So I'm jumping a lot because um, obviously we're not going to talk about everything. Um, mm -hmm in the book but there are there are beautiful paintings of canto bite and uh so good a lot, of, a lot of the aliens on canto bite yep and speaking of that prequel connection um i think there's a lot of that um, in that section as well but i'm going to skip all the way to page 203 and on 203 there's some um production art of the vice admiral haldo um and Sorry, I'm just I'm skipping so many pages, but there's like so much to look at. <laughs> mm -hmm. that I'm like, oh, look at that, uh, and stopping in my process of jumping ahead. So, um, but yeah, there's some there's some discussion of the design for um, Holdo, and uh, the fact that she, um, the fact that she has like this kind of like contrast in her personality and the way she's presented. Um, in that, uh, they wanted her to look very feminine and, um, uh, to, you know, have these gowns and, and to have a very like, uh, a feminine look. I think, um, they even use the term like, oh yeah, balletic, like almost like a, a ballet, you know, balletic. Mm -hmm. Um, and I love that because, uh, and I've heard Laura Dern talk about it too, but the idea that, um, 
the movie advances the uh, the concept that you know you can be feminine and still be strong and powerful and all those things and that you don't have to like um look more masculine or try to wear like more you know masculine clothing or something you can be very feminine and still be very strong so i think that's uh that's really cool and uh, a conscious part of the design of Aldo, not a continuity error um, as i've heard some of my friends try to point it out to be so <laughs> I'm not better. Okay. I'm not like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no subtweeting here. Right. The whole episode is just a subtweet. It's just me being <laughs> like, hey, friend of mine who says stupid stuff about this movie, like, <laughs> let me show you why you're wrong <laughs> via the art of book. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, but, um, and then I, I guess I'm kind of like, I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to point out in the art of book here, Ryan. Um, I'm kind of getting to the end of uh, what I've done notes wise. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, page 241, um, I found really interesting. This is in the final section. It's called Binary Sunset. Um, and uh, and by the way, the, the way that um, the different sections of the movie, um, the, the book is modeled after like these different sections of the movie, but it also kind of tells the story from the beginning of the production process to the end of the production process. Um, it's very kind of seamless and like works together really well. And mm -hmm. uh, it's just really well done. So it's a, it's a wonderful book. Um, but here in 241, like towards the very end, um, there's a little tidbit about the fact that uh, Ryan Johnson turned in his first draft of the script on March 4th, 2015. Um, and that's just like, I was reading that the other day and I was thinking about it. It's like, wow, that's a good nine months, I think, before The Force Awakens even came out and the script for The Last Jedi, the first draft of the script for The Last Jedi was already complete, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so that's just, it's just cool. It's just, I, I mean, it, it makes sense in the, in the, in the, in the sense that like movies take a long time to make. And of course they'd be working on them for a long time. Um, but you know, I, I wasn't thinking I like in March of 2015 when mm -hmm. I, I hadn't even seen the force awakens yet. Um, I don't think I would have had any concept of, of the fact that like, Oh, they're already, you know, well into coming up with the next one and all that kind of thing. So, um, just a cool, cool tidbit there. Um, and then, um, there's also one more thing, which I think is, uh, a good way to kind of sum up, um, a lot of, of, um, what's going on here in in this book like it's a book about the people who um created the art uh for this movie and uh b about that art itself and there's this quote from uh, ryan johnson where he's kind of saying like how, what a great team um he worked with and he said uh beyond that they all loved what they were doing they all just love star wars and as weird as this sounds considering what we're doing the vibe was never let's create and idolize the past the vibe was always we all know this world in our bones from growing up with it but let's make something new and exciting in it um, that's something we all shared and we felt naturally, uh, or we all naturally felt. So it was real, but also like we were slipping into a pair of comfortable shoes. And I think that's just a great quote to kind of, um, represent this book about, uh, the art of the last Jedi and the, even the movie itself too, you know, the idea that like, Hey, it's not about recreating and idolizing the past, but it's something that's kind of like inherent in, in the people making the movies is a, a love for star Wars. So let's do something new with it. But, um, you, know, you can't deny that it's um, just like foundational for uh, them. And, you know, obviously I think a lot of us feel that way too. So just a great, great quote. Anything else uh, from the art of Ryan before we move on to some other books? No, um, just, I guess going back to what you were saying about the structure of the book and the readability, like it really does read in a very like coherent way and it it does tell a story from beginning to end um in kind of contrast to like the visual dictionary which is just you know a sequence of tidbits and facts um but i think like the two books really complement each other um but the art book is definitely the um the one that you just like sit down and read sequentially and it does tell you, you know, the story of the film and the story of the production. And um, it's really, really great. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's published by Abrams Books, which is Mm -hmm. more of a high-end collector. um, And definitely, you know, those books are are targeted at adult audiences who want to have, like, really beautiful, um, high-quality, kind of like coffee table style books. Uh, And um, then the Visual Dictionary, which we're going to jump into now, is published by DK, uh, Mm -hmm. which... um, you know, they they put out a ton of great Star Wars books, but their stuff is is um, you know more specifically targeted towards young audiences. So um, it's definitely less about the production of the movie and just more about providing some really fun, um, you know, kind of detailed information about uh, about the movies. So um, and I think their Pablo Hidalgo, who writes the uh, visual dictionary books. Um, does a really good job of making these um, very interesting, I think, for young audiences as well as adults. Because, you know, I love to pour over these books too. But uh, yesterday, my eight-year-old son, um, I was trying to get him like ready to go and get out of the house. And like, I could not p- pull him away from uh, this book, which he, he had found sitting on my desk. And um, he was just like enthralled with it, you know, looking mm-hmm. at every page. And and uh, yeah, it's very readable for kids and, and very uh, readable for adults is what I'm um trying to say i think so but yeah let's let's jump into uh let's jump into the visual dictionary and you're going to kind of take the lead more on this one so yeah i mean i guess it's like kind of telling about like who i am that like this is the the book that like i connect with more um because this is the book you come at like um you know the art of book you can is like the sophisticated book it's the grounded in reality book it's grounded in the creative process um this is the book for like just total marks where you (laughs) uh suspend all disbelief and you're like this is facts about the star wars universe that Mm -hmm. exists it is real (laughs) and uh this is the truth this is the encyclopedia yeah, yeah, totally, totally. And it's got like also a lot of great jokes and stuff in there too, which um I think is is totally up your alley as well. Yeah, there's some like really deep cuts. So, let's just go ahead and um get into it um right from the get-go. Um there's the map of the galaxy, which I think does a really good job of setting the stage for everything and actually seeing all of this in all of the planets in this context really um you know it just it gives you like a nice overview um because you have stuff like jetta and the unknown regions and um and uh then you also have uh luke's route that he took to octo mm-hmm. um which is really interesting because, um, you know, like it's, uh, I, I think it's just really interesting seeing how close, um, Octo is to the, um, unknown regions, um, which is kind of where the, um, first order built up their, um, armies Mm -hmm. for, um so many years like it's and it's where snoke is from yeah 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 so that's just kind of interesting and again it's just one of those things that's just cool to like look at and um contextualize everything well it is cool and it's it is it, 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 am i reading this right that like the little dotted line is luke's route to octo because mm-hmm. um, then it's showing like other planets he stopped off at too like uh kashik and um i don't know where else uh uh yeah i don't know that's interesting huh cool yeah um and that is i mean like that is definitely a a story Mm -hmm. um a story which will probably probably be told yeah at some point um yeah yeah um Cool. So, like, moving on, there's a breakdown of the ships in the Resistance fleet. And, um, again, I think, um, you know, it it could be argued that um, the, like, literal movement of the um, Resistance fleet is kind of 
what moves the story in The Last Jedi. Um, that's kind of like the backbone of the story. And um, I remember like the first time and even second time I watched the film, um, I didn't really have like a good understanding of the the breakdown of the ships. Like I didn't really, um, I wasn't able to like put the pieces together, like um, what, how many ships there were, what their roles were, um, why it's significant when certain ones are um, destroyed. And also like, where does Holdo come from? Um, mm -hmm. And this is, I think does a really, um, nice job of kind of breaking that down. Yeah. 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 The Ninka. Yeah. One of those looks similar to that ship in Rogue One. The, uh, it's referred to here as a bunker buster. Um, but yeah, it's like a, it would ram into other ships, I think. Right. Yeah. 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 So, mm hmm. Um, and then kind of moving on again within the resistance fleet, this is where I think like we got our c first cool little bit of trivia here. Mm -hmm. um, cool little connection. And that is um, in the bit about um, Admiral Akbar, RIP. Rest in peace. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that his, uh, his ship is known as the Radis. Mm-hmm. Um, which is, you know, obviously the ship from Rogue One. And it talks about his, like, um, his begrudging respect for uh, Admiral Radis. And, yeah. Um, and I think that's just, uh, like, a really great connection. There was a little Mon Cal rivalry between the two of them. Um, yeah. But then Akbar chose to honor him in the end with uh, naming that ship that way. So, yeah, that's definitely cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so <laughs> now um, I'm jumping ahead a few pages, and now I'm, like, actually <laughs> starting to get kind of confused why I mark some of this stuff. <laughs> um, I'm on page 21, and... Um, I just have a post-it note here that says PZ's job. Um, okay. <laughs> referring to uh, PZ, uh, I guess I wanted to talk about his job. Or As her assistant job. evacuator? Yeah, her. Yeah. her job. Assistant um, evacuator. A first aid medic and duty nurse. Uh -huh. um, yeah, PZ. Oh it, was, it was good to see PZ. In yeah. The Last Jedi. Well, a lot of people hate PZ, um, which is interesting. I, I'm fine with PZ. I, I bought her toy. I have her toy from Force Awakens. I like her. I, I do as well, yeah. Um, I'm probably more partial to Buford, who is also shown on page uh, 21, albeit in a much smaller screenshot, but uh, bu 40 Buford. Mm. Uh, I like that guy. Uh, he's cool. Um, and then I'm seeing the uh, the Resistance BB units down here, which uh, look good. I'm glad they're like not as colorful and memorable as uh, BB-8. And mm -hmm. that was another interesting thing in the Art of book was um, the discussion of creating the First Order version of the BB units or even the other Resistance uh, versions of them. They had to make them share the same kind of like DNA or blueprint or whatever, but then also had to sort of like BB-8 has so much personality and they were talking about designing other BB units. You have to find ways to like remove the personality because um, then obviously BB-8 is is more um, stands out more and is more memorable. So um, I thought that was that was interesting. It's like, well, we made this really cute face with BB-8, and it's so expression, you know, has so much expression and stuff. And mm -hmm. then how do we, uh, you know, kind of like take some of that back, dial that back a little bit? Uh, I like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, still uh, in the in the resistance uh, business because this is uh, one of my jams in Star Wars. I love the whole, um, you know, I've, I've talked about it on the show many times that I love the whole like shipyards and like pilots and all of that um, side of it. Um, but yeah, on going ahead to page 24, um, we have uh, Tally. Um, who is a prominent um, pilot in the uh, in the resistance? She has uh, some big moments uh, 
in the film, um, I believe she makes she makes her first appearance during the bombing run of the Dreadnought. Mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's and, in the A-Wing. Yeah. Um, and then I have a question for you. Um, does she survive the film? No way, man. She's on the uh she's she's in like the hangar or whatever. The hangar bay when it gets blown up, right? Yeah, when when Poe's like, everybody get to your X Wings and all that. Like, yeah, she's she's in a ship and I think you see a reaction That's... shot from her when that explosion. Yeah, goes. it's yeah. like it's super brief, but yeah. Yeah. Um which also is rest in peace, Tally. Yeah. Yeah, which is like a huge tragedy t- too. I mean, it's um you know, all the losses there were a tragedy, but you know, it's saying in this book, she's only 22 years old. Oh, yeah. Mm. Tally, we barely knew you gone too soon. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I guess on a lighter note, mm. um, well, maybe not because he's probably dead too. Um, on page 25, we have the resistance's <laughs> own Jack Porkins. <laughs> um, <laughs> J. Chris Tubbs, Uh who is also a uh, stocky gentleman. (laughs) Um, Yeah, and whose uh, whose children's names are stenciled on his uh, his fighter helmet too. Yeah, Yeah. actually, I do think I think we do see a a reaction shot of him getting blown up. Oh no! Yeah, Uh, uh. it's um, because like I remember seeing that in the film and immediately thought, oh, that's very uh, very Porkins ask well that's one of the things about the last jedi is that uh by the end of the movie there are not many resistance pilots or um members left so yeah most of the resistance characters that we're going to see in the movie or even in the uh the visual dictionary are probably not going to survive to the end mm-hmm. yeah and then uh we have also on this page i think uh blast points refers to him as fake elo asti <laughs> <laughs> Was it uh, Kai Thrinali or Sai Thrinali? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that uh, what is that? What is that race? Abinetto. Okay, uh, I don't and know exactly was, how you pronounce it, but Abinetto. Yeah, and that was a race that's uh, new to the sequel trilogy. Yeah, I believe so. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then okay, so now that we've gone through a lot of the important stuff, I'm just like pass it, paging through past Kylo Ren and <laughs> what all this. Yeah, sorry. Um, this is what's important to me in the visual dictionary. Okay, all right. Captain Kennedy, right? Um, or are we oh, going past Captain Kennedy? Yes, but okay. um, I do love Captain Kennedy. He mm-hmm. is uh, he is a, a memorable as far as like Imperials go, um, who get to say like three lines before being blown up. <laughs> um, he is he is top tier. I do like him a lot. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, so I guess here, and this is almost like incredible cross sections uh, material here, but the supremacy on page thirty-two, yeah, um, Snoke's ship. Yep. You know, <laughs> I always something that's been weird um, with Star Wars is there has always been this. Um, I, I feel from A New Hope on there's you know, you start with, um, you know, the first shot in A New Hope is the Star Destroyer. And it's like, you know, that that shot is so iconic um, because of just like the size and the scope of that ship. And it it kind of feels that through subsequent movies, there's always this like, well, this is a super Star Destroyer that's even bigger. (laughs) And um, I feel like with the supremacy um the the size of ships has like it needs reached, to stop like from <laughs> it's reached its logical ridiculous conclusion yeah. of like this is basically like a galaxy right right, right. this ship oh. it's like 80 planets <laughs> like in no a ship. no it's not it's not that much it is so big because you look at it and there's <laughs> It, this like tiny part on the on like the left wing is the star destroyer docking bays yeah <laughs> which yeah. is just like it's so ridiculous like that it's, uh well it's very big it's 60 stuff. it's 60 kilometers wide um which i'm not great at the kilometer to miles uh conversion but what's that like 45 miles wide or something like that i don't know something something like that 
Um, so yeah. like a huge city, I guess, uh, although it's very oh, narrow. Yeah. So it's like basically a floating city, a really big floating city. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it says in there somewhere that there's like, I don't know, millions, a hundred million. Yeah. Like, or like, yeah, a crew, a small in country. The it's like yeah. a floating small country. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that is absurd. Uh, I will though, I will say like in defense of, uh, you know, the, the production, uh, here, um, that uh, Snoke doesn't have like a planet that he lives on or goes back to or anything like that. So like, this is like his basically like capital city, except it's a spaceship yeah. instead of a planet. So um, I guess it kind of makes more, it's still crazy and you know, whatever, but um, there's a little bit of like a story purpose for having a ship that. Generally. No, no, I think it's, I think it's fine. Like I'm mm -hmm. not like actually mad about it. It's just, it's, it is so absurd though. Um, and in a way, like when I was thinking about it in like this context of it being like such a base of operation and, and um, in, in a lot of ways, this is almost like a twist on the, on the like Death Star, Starkiller base um, type uh, machination, um, at least in terms of, um, you know, strategic purpose and like holding of um their military yeah. and i don't think it's really um i don't i don't know if it's like totally contextualized in the in the film that when um when holdo like destroys the supremacy essentially she kind of like blew up a death star in a way or uh, i think more appropriately would be star killer base which we kind of see as you know a base of operations and there's like tons of first order people on here but it's saying here that there are millions of first order um troops and personnel on this thing so yeah. it is actually like a really um in addition to like one of the absolute coolest shots and moments in star wars history like it is a very um you know uh a good uh kick in the pants to yeah. the uh to the first order yeah yeah for sure i mean um i guess luckily or unluckily or depending on how um um uh, strong your thirst for death is uh it's like not as many people die i think because um you know like it, it seems pretty clear when you watch the movie that um you know probably a lot of people on the supremacy could have survived because it just kind of like cut it into pieces mm -hmm. uh, but like Ray and Kylo Ren and everybody are like on the supremacy and you know they survive so like um, it just kind of splits it up into chunks and then there'd probably be a lot of evacuation happening and stuff uh, also lots of people dead I'm not saying that there would definitely have been like a lot of people dead and then um, I'll have to watch it again I'm, I might try to go later today to see The Last Jedi if I can mm -hmm. but uh I think there's like a couple of Star Destroyers behind it that also get like destroyed when she does that or something. It's, it like sets off a little bit of a chain reaction and ends up yeah. like, taking out a couple of ships, I think. But, um, but yeah, it just kind of like destroys um, the supremacy, um, kills probably a lot of the people uh, or quite a few people on the supremacy. But then, um, you know, it's more like destroying their ship and not their whole, you know, the, the, the Death Star, uh, that was just like took out <laughs> a ton of people all in one hit. And, and this mm -hmm. maybe not quite as destructive and or deadly. Yeah. Well, but a similar to, for sure. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe there'll be a, a star Wars book released at some point, like ultimate body counts or something. <laughs> <laughs> and there'll be like little graphs. And <laughs> uh, well, there might be a page like that in the, um, uh, what's that book? The uh, the Star Super Wars. Data, the yeah, one. yeah. yeah. Like that. Although it wouldn't have this in there, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Shout okay. out to the First Order for referring to teenagers as sub adults, which is uh, just so weird and creepy. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that on page uh, thirty three, but um, their junior officers are referred to not as teenagers or adolescents, but sub adults. Hmm. So, really wow. creepy. Yeah. Oh wow. Um, sorry, not to steal uh -huh. your thunder here or take, no, no, no. take away your your um, your ownership of this section, but I just flipped to page thirty five, and uh, the Visual Dictionary points out that the black uh, stone on Snoke's ring is obsidian from catacombs beneath Darth Vader's Mustafar Castle. Oh, there you go. It seems suspicious to me. Why would mm. he have that? Yeah. Um... Well, there you go. Okay. All right. 
Uh, something else that's really cool on this page, on page 35, that I was very excited about were the attendants. Yes. Um, who we get a glimpse of, of from in the film, a tantalizing glimpse. Um, but that's, uh, that's it. Um, yeah, they're they, cool. They, they're, they're they the... operate the Oculus, um, which gives Snoke his view into the galaxy. Yeah. To the haps of the galaxy. Yeah. And they're, they're mute alien navigators. It says, um, I, I love the look of these guys and I love mm-hmm. the name too, attendants. Um, I feel like the job is a little underwhelming based on their like visual design though. You know what I mean? Like, ah, uh, we, we, uh, we operate this magnifying glass um, just cause like, I would love for them to have like a more creepy occultish, like spiritual type, um, you know, occupation of some kind. Cause that's, I feel like that's what their look suggests. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, but it's whatever. It's cool. Um, some, some sort of like seance or something that yeah, they perform. You, yeah. And you don't have to explain it to me. I don't want to know exactly what happens, but I would like them to just have like more of a, a cultish kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, they worship Snoke or something, or they, I don't know. There's some unknown regions version of the Sith that they're priests of or something like that. I think that'd be cool, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so moving on, we got some Praetorian guard stuff. Um, did you see that there is a Praetorian guard, uh, themed heart shaped chocolate box, um, that's out for this Valentine's day season. Did you see that? Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, dinosaur Dracula, uh, tweeted that out and, or maybe it was the sexy armpit. I'm not sure, but, uh, I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah. Um, actually, if you had to, uh, target now, um, their, uh, their Valentine's day star Wars, um, game is on point. Like there is, uh, there is some really good stuff that, uh, I am, I'm hoping that I, uh, (laughs) Receive for Valentine's Day. I know. I think Walmart has, and maybe other places do too. But they have these uh, the set of four glasses from Zach Designs that have like classic uh, uh, seventy seven or seventy eight um, Star Wars action figures on them with like little Valentine's Day themed word bubbles. Um, mm. But uh, I'd like to get those too. I think they're like less than ten dollars for a set of four. So. Oh, nice. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I cut you off. You were talking about the Praetorian Guards. Um, yep, they exist. Mm-hmm. And uh, they have some different weapons and cool stuff. Um, but the next thing I wanted to talk about was on page 39 mm. um, on Rose's uh, two pages here. Mm-hmm. Um, because they actually, um, you know, they show the... Uh, resistance ring which i believe is a new concept introduced here in the last jedi i don't know if it appeared in something else at some point i don't think so i think this was a concept that that um ryan johnson probably came up with for this movie yeah um i think it's it's really cool i like it how do you feel about the resistance ring uh, it's fun. Uh, you know, if, I think if you think about like 1940s or whatever decade it would have been like serials and stuff like mm-hmm. it, it seems very Dakota rings. Yeah. So I like like bringing Star Wars back to that um, connection and that that era and stuff. So um, if I think about it from that perspective, then I think it works and it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, that being said, the <laughs> the explanation here is kind of humorous. I think it's a uh, it's an antique from the Galactic Civil War, and um, it was once used to show support for the rebellion in the corridors of the Imperial Senate. So, um, never mind me. I have this giant gold ring on uh, with a <laughs> that clearly has like a window that I can flip to show the symbol. Um, and it just so happens that me and a bunch of other people all wear these. But uh, you don't know what that means about <laughs> us. You know I, mean? like, I feel like that would be <laughs> like on day three of running around with these decoder rings on, everybody would know exactly what they were for. Um, (laughs) Unless they all look different from one another or something. But even then, uh, I feel like it's just not, I don't know. It's just not a a really good way of, um, of hiding (laughs) a connection to the rebellion. But um, so I think it works better. And, but okay. And this is just fun. Like who cares? Like I, you know, it's all, it's all fun and, and whatever, but like, 
this is where as I'm reading a book like this, um, I'm looking at this and thinking to myself, okay, so what came first, like the backstory or the elements itself? And I think clearly what it is, is Ryan Johnson's like, hey, we should have a decoder ring in The Last Jedi. That's like a cool callback, whatever. And then, you know, a year later, Pablo has to come up with a story for it for the visual dictionary. <laughs> and that's what he comes up with. So I enjoy reading this stuff and I think it's fun. But then it's also like, I'm not going to watch the movie and think about the fact that like, oh, well, actually during the Galactic Republic era, you know, senators are running around with this ring on. Like, I don't have to worry about it to that extent. So, but it's fun to read, you know, that I almost look at it as like a possibility more than like a cold hard fact, you know, because it's not really from the movie. It's more, I think these things are are there to support the movie more so than, you know, be a uh, gospel um, in relation to the movie, if you know what I mean. So, mm -hmm. and I, I would take a similar approach to the black obsidian ring uh, on Snoke's finger that apparently came from Darth Vader's lair on Mustafar. Like, all right, maybe. Um, but <laughs> I think <laughs> for me, it's just going to remain uh, like a cool ring on Snoke's finger, <laughs> more likely. Yeah. Um, at least for the time being. So, well, we'll see. We'll yeah. see when uh, episode nine opens with the, the ring floating through space. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. So let's go ahead and jump to page 42 to uh -huh. Temple Island. Oh um, <laughs> because this is this is where the good stuff is. Mm. Um, we've we've got our uh, Thala sirens here. Mm -hmm. um, those uh, those creatures um, that milk that uh, Luke really enjoys the milk from. Uh Yep, they um, they are not hunted, and they do not fear the natives of the island. Um, but they produce a nutritious green milk that Luke has taken to harvesting. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. They're docile and uh, good friends. Good friends with Luke. Yeah. Mm hmm. And we also see here on page forty-two, um, an, like a sort of like low-key reference to Octo. Uh, or Octu, I don't know how it's pronounced, um, actually having twin sons, um, which I'm personally not a fan of myself, um, but it's mm. cool. It doesn't really matter. But uh, I know um, after my first viewing of uh, The Last Jedi, I was like, why are there two sons on Octo at the end? That's stupid. Like, like there shouldn't be two sons. And then I saw the movie, uh, you know, another time, another two times, another three times, whatever. And I was like, oh, you know what? Like, I actually love the idea that, like, in Luke's final moments, he's seeing a recreation of the twin sons from Tatooine. Like, that's just like, that's what he's seeing. You know what I mean? Cause it's so poignant and like, it doesn't matter that there aren't actually two sons on Ecto. Like who cares? It's almost better that there's not. And yet he's seeing two sons. Um, and now it's like, Oh, well, Octo just happens to also have two sons that look just like the two sons on Tatooine. I don't, you know, I, I would rather they not explain that or not try to retcon it or whatever. Maybe it's not retconning. Maybe Ryan Johnson always envisioned it having two sons, but you never see two sons at any other point. Like, you know, I guess you never really see the sons of Octo, but or the son of Octo, but um, yeah, I just rather have it be a planet with one son, like most other planets, and yet Luke sees two sons in his final moments. You know, yeah, I don't really have a strong opinion on that, <laughs> one way or another. <laughs> All right, like, fair that, enough. That that scene is wonderful, but I also get kind of what you're saying. Um, again, it's like I'd like know. it to be more metaphysical and less realistic. Is my sure. Thing. Sure. Um, okay, I'm just like skipping through the Luke pages. <laughs> Sorry. <Okay. What>? Um, <laughs> but uh, going going back to uh, on page 51, we get a little bit more about the caretakers and um, specifically how so their their race is known as uh, Lanais. Mm -hmm. Um. And the caretakers on Octo are all female. Uh-huh. Um, again, with like that kind of uh nun existence. Um but then uh it also talks about the visitors mm -hmm. in the book, which <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's something very suggestive about that, isn't there? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um so <laughs> I'm I'm just gonna read this whole thing and I'll right. I'll let uh dear listener draw your own conclusions. 
The male lanais <laughs> are known as the visitors due to their infrequent presence on the island itself. The males are hunters and gatherers in the Lanai's society, spending their lives aboard handcrafted boats that travel the open seas and journey to nearby islands. They return monthly with hauls of fish that they and the females process for food and tools. Yeah, I mean, that's cool. Like uh, they they go do their own thing at sea, and then they stop back to be useful. You know, bringing back um, fish for mm-hmm. the caretakers. I love it. Hey, at the top of page fifty one, uh, this just occurred to me for the first time. You see that shot in the corner, the top right corner on page fifty one. Yeah. Um, that's not in the movie, is it? I don't no. remember. That shot. we don't see the visitors at all. I think this is a deleted scene, uh, definitely a deleted scene. But there is a uh, there there is a sequence um, that involves the third lesson that Luke never was able to deliver to Ray in the final cut of the movie. Mm-hmm. That involves a party down on the beach, a caretaker party down on the beach, and I think we're seeing a shot of that here. Um, oh, which I have heard about the sequence. I've heard it discussed. I think it's actually discussed in detail in the Art of book. Um, and uh, I think I've I've even seen Ryan Johnson or Pablo Hidalgo or somebody make reference to it. Um, so I think that'll be on the Blu-ray, I'm hoping. And we'll probably see some of this caretaker uh, party, this multi-day caretaker romp, or I should say lanai romp, I guess. Oh, since the man. caretakers and the visitors are there. Well, that, that sounds great. Mm-hmm, that is mm-hmm. uh, something to look forward to on that Blu-ray. Yeah. Um, Chewbacca... Okay, so now um, we're <laughs> approaching <laughs> approaching the the end here, um, but uh, the Canto Bite section. Mm. So this is so good. Um, page fifty four. It starts, and um, I love the uh, synergy within the Lucasfilm Publishing Department. Um, because every, every character that's featured in the Canto Bite book, um, is pictured here, uh, in this section. So, um, you know, in, in the, in the book, um, the four short stories, you, um, you know, you're reading about these characters, but this, uh, this section actually shows them, like, most of them appear in the film. So it's like screen grabs from the film and um, the ones who don't like uh, Lexo and Sturg um, still are pictured here as well. And they were obviously like modeled in some capacity to potentially be in the film, but um, were cut. But um yeah, so that's uh that's really cool um having that uh that connection and something because I got the visual dictionary actually before I started reading Canto Bite and okay. um I've actually only read the first 3 stories. I still haven't read the the fourth one yet. Um but I will say like the stories are excellent. Um I'm super super into that book. Um, because I really, really love Canto Bite. And um, something, so I had, I was, I had flipped through the visual dictionary first before um, starting um, the book Canto Bite. And I remember like texting you and Kevin because I was captivated by um, two characters on page 61. And that is, and those characters are the Grammis sisters, um, who have this <laughs> very like symmetrical, creepy design. Uh-huh. Um, and I was like, man, I want to know like what is the deal with these characters? Like, they're so cool looking. Um, and then uh, the second story in the Canto Bite book 
uh, kind of centers around them. And that is uh, really, really cool. Um, I don't know. It, it makes me very happy. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, they are very they are very creepy, aren't they? A um, lot of creepy designs here on page 61, actually, now that I'm looking <laughs> more. Closely. Oh, yeah. The Countess. Uh, <laughs> not really too into Abla Mulbro either. Oh, no. He grosses me out in the movie and yeah. in the book. So, but yeah, the Countess is pretty, pretty uh, gross looking also. And um, even Snook Ukerfe, um, <laughs> I'm not, uh, not too into that either. So, yeah. Um, Neeper's Pan Pick. Uh, he, uh, he's no, a. Hey, I like him. Yeah. He's a he's a character that makes an a, a appearance in the uh, in the book, um, but then I guess like hopping over, I mean it would be impossible to <laughs> move on uh, past this uh, two page spread here without going back to page sixty and talking about the master codebreaker. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the Master Codebreaker is great. Yeah, you got to balance it out. You have some real sick-looking characters on page sixty-one, um, and then the absolutely gorgeous Master Codebreaker and Lovey also. Mm, um, the no, mysterious no, Lovey, <laughs> Lovey, which we get a little bit more information about her. Yeah, she's actually casing the Master Codebreaker, hoping to uh, usurp him and take his title as Master Codebreaker, um, which is awesome. Yeah, and. Uh, and that's like something great we find out about um, the Master Codebreaker here is that um, he has no one knows who he is, but he he has all that information ripe for the taking, um, but it's locked behind a um, biohexacrypt code <laughs> um, that if you're able to uh break that code um then and find out who the master code breaker really is then that person who does that gets to become the next master code breaker which i think is fascinating and wonderful and you know i i want more media about this like i want a book or an episode of a tv show or a comic series or something about like the the whole master codebreaker thing <laughs> well, because like as you said um lovey is <laughs> trying to uh trying to like crack the code and um you know she's working her machinations to uh potentially be the next master code breaker not now lovey mm -hmm. yeah um and i feel like we've i mean we've done it at least twice already on this episode but we got to give a shout out to blast points here too um mm -hmm. when i heard both the words master code breaker and biohexacrypt um i thought well you know this is definitely blast points territory so um they uh really hopped on to the biohexacrypt uh thing you know months before the movie came out and it was a lot of fun so yeah um oh man but yeah there's there's so much good story to tell here like how how the master code breaker is forbidden from electronic forms of entertainment mm -hmm. in canto bite he can only roll dice yeah he can't do the slot machines that would be crazy yeah so oh yeah i want that story mm. um moving on we have um the uh Fathers, 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 um, and uh, we have uh, we have Broom Boy at Tim the bottom of page sixty-three. Mm -hmm. Tamiri Black is that his name? Tamiri mm -hmm. Black. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's just you know kind of interesting getting his uh his actual name. Mm -hmm. Widely misinterpreted, I believe, as being a, an important character in the future uh, rather than a symbolic one. Uh, just in the last Jedi, but um, I'm not the first to say this. But I think the fact that his, the character's name is Tamiri Blag demonstrates uh, they don't have um, big plans for this character in the future. Mm. It's going to be the so. the star of Episode Nine. Ray is going to train him uh, yeah. to become the next Jedi. I don't think his name would be Tamiri Blag if that was the case, but we'll see. 
<laughs> yep. Who knows? Um, let's see. We have, what is, I have one more thing marked. I have no idea what it is. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm like jumping ahead. Oh, yeah. And this one, uh, <laughs> this is one of those very, very wonderful in jokes um, on page 74. Um, <laughs> this is like the the deepest of cuts. Um, at the bottom of page 74, they're talking about the First Order um, walkers assembling on Crate, and they uh, it's mentioned here that they assemble in classic Veers formation. Oh, nice. Nice. Um, which uh, actually was an intentional shout-out by Pablo to the uh, Twitter account Veers Watch, <laughs> which is... Uh, one of my favorite um, Twitter accounts. That's a great account. Um, yeah. Um, um, but yeah, it was uh, very intentional on Pablo's part to uh, to throw Veers watch a bone and uh, get some get some Veers formation in there. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, anything else that you wanted to talk about about the Visual Dictionary? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, I think that it's a little. Um... I guess, you know, the nature of the book, uh, there's not much need for a focus on the the very end of the, the movie. But uh, I would say the visual dictionary, it's, it's interesting. Like you get to Crate and it's like, well, there's Crate military stuff and then it kind of ends there. And I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, but the movie, you know, there's the whole cave sequence. And uh, I don't know. It just feels like um, maybe I, I would have loved to have seen a little more about like Luke. Um, showing up on uh on on octo and uh, or not on octo on um on crate Great. at the end yeah a little more I, think, on that. I think that might be another case of things being intentionally withheld um yeah, to preserve I think so. the film going experience yeah yeah because like the 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 part with um the flashback stuff is not really Mm-hmm. in here either there's like one photo of it um and maybe there's not that much you know content to look at there but i would think like kylo ren's lightsaber or ben solo's lightsaber at the time and like you know mm-hmm. the huts and the temple itself and stuff like i don't know that could be cool so maybe we'll get an expanded last Jedi visual dictionary or maybe some of that stuff will pop up in in uh i don't know something else a later a later version of a book like this but yeah i could see them doing like um a once once episode nine is out um because they they do revise and expanded versions of these books um that is a very dk thing mm-hmm. but the, um you know like in the at the end of the prequel trilogy they release the ultimate star wars um book which uh is kind of a more text heavy version of the visual dictionary but i could see them doing like a sequel trilogy um ultimate visual dictionary or something with like all three movies and like i don't know that would be cool that'd be awesome yeah and maybe some more of the spoilery stuff which um you know going by how the visual like a good chunk of the visual dictionary leaked beforehand uh it's probably a good idea that they didn't have like oh this is this is luke's robe after he <laughs> <laughs> yeah puts away into the ether <laughs> like, yeah yeah yeah, um, totally. yeah that was probably for the best